Hi, welcome to your 12.1 day one lesson video. Today we're starting a new unit, chapter 12 on probability. The unit goal is I can find the probability of events and combinations of events. Today's lesson, 12.1 day one, is on probability events. The essential question that we'll be answering is how does describing events as mutually exclusive or independent affect how you find probabilities? On day one here, we're going to focus on some basic probability calculations and mutually exclusive events. In 12.1 day two, we'll hit on independent probabilities. So let's get started. A big part of doing probability calculations involves being familiar with both fractions, decimals, and percents, and being able to convert between the forms. If you're given a fraction and you want a decimal, that's the easiest. You can do that all on your calculator. For example, 3 over 4, if we want that as a decimal, you just do 3 divided by 4, and your calculator is going to give you 0.75. That is already to two decimals, so we don't have to do any rounding. Same thing with 4 fifths. Just do 4, divide by 5 on your calculator, and you'll get 0.8. Technically, if we want two decimals, we can rewrite that as 0.80. 7 over 20. If you go 7 divided by 20, that is equal to 0.35. Oh, by the way, you can put the 0 in front of it or just 0.35. So you'll see that written two ways, 0.35 or just 0 0.35. When it comes to converting from decimals to fractions, that's a little bit trickier. What you want to do is you want to look at what place your last digit is in. So 65, 5 is in the hundredths place. Remember, the first place is the tenths place, then the hundredths, then the thousandths. Since it's the hundredth place, we put 65 over 100, and then we can go ahead and reduce that fraction by dividing by 5. And that gets us down to 13 over 20. So that is my fraction in lowest terms. If you're given a percentage, a percent just means a part of 100. So 82% would be 82 out of 100, and we can reduce that down. I know that both 82 and 100 are even numbers, so I'm just going to divide by 2 here, and that's 41 out of 50. 41 is a prime number, so it doesn't reduce any further. Same thing here on 14%. That's 14 out of 100, and again, if we divide that by 2, we'll get 7 out of 50. That's simplified all the way because 7 is a prime and doesn't go into 50. Just a quick reminder too, that if you want to switch a percent to a decimal, you can just move it over two places to the left. For example, 82%, the decimal point is after the two. If we move it over two spots to the left, that is 0 0.82. 14% as a decimal would be 0 0.14. So we're going to be converting between percents, fractions, and decimals a lot as we do probability calculations. Let's look at this explore and reason before we jump into our lesson. Suppose Allie spins the spinner shown and draws one card without looking. She gets a three on the spinner and draws the three card. Then she sets the card aside, spins again, and draws another card. Is it possible for Allie to get a three on her second spin? And again, she's using this spinner. Remember that she already spun a three on her first spin. Would it be possible for her to spin a three on her second spin? Yes, it would. So she could spin a three on that second spin because even though she got it the first time, all four sections are still on the spinner. So it's still possible for her to land on a three again. With the cards though, things are a little bit different. Remember that she's spinning the three on the spinner and draws the three card, then she sets the card aside. So after she draws out the three, she's going to take that card and set it aside because she already drew it on her first draw. Could she get a three on her second draw? No. And again, she just set that aside. There's only a one, two, or four card left, so it's impossible for her to get the three. For the next part of the question, how does getting the three card on her first draw affect the probability of getting the two card on her second draw? Here we need to think a little bit more abstractly. On the first draw, the probability of getting a two card would be one out of four because there are four cards and one of them is a two. But now on her second draw, let's think about what the probability of getting a two would be on the second draw. 
On the second draw, since she removed the three card, the probability of getting a two card would be one out of three because there's one two card and there's three cards left. So that's 33%. So the probability actually increases because she took out that first card. It increased to 33%, whereas if she hadn't taken out that first three on her first card, it would have been 25% on the first draw, but after she's drawn out a card, now it's increased up to 33%. Before we jump into the examples for this lesson, let's review some vocabulary. An event is something that has possible outcomes, but we don't know which will happen. An example of an event would be spinning a spinner or drawing a card. A sample space is all the possible outcomes of an event. For a classic example, suppose we have this dice, or sometimes called a number cube. It's a standard six-sided die. All of the possible outcomes would be the sample space. So we know when we spin a spinner, we could get either a one, a two, a three, four, five, or six. Oftentimes we list the possible outcomes in squiggly brackets. Mutually exclusive events are events that cannot both happen at the same time. This definition is really important and we're gonna be working with mutually exclusive events in this lesson. An example of a mutually exclusive event would be rolling a three and an even number on a dice. If we roll a die, it's impossible to have the number be a three as well as an even number because three is not even. So we can't be three and even at the same time. Hence, rolling a three and rolling an even number would be mutually exclusive events. Our last vocabulary word for today is complement. The complement of an event is the set of all outcomes in a sample space that are not included in that event. So sometimes when we do probability, we might ask you, what's the probability of rolling a five? I might ask you for the complement of that and say, what's the probability of not rolling a five? So with that, let's review just some basic probability calculations. Remember that to calculate the probability of an event, you take the number of favorable outcomes divided by the number of possible outcomes. For notation, for probability of an event, you use a capital P and then you put the event in parentheses like probability of three, I could put a three there for event, and I would do the number of favorable outcomes divided by the number of total possible outcomes. So for this first example, if you roll the dice once, what's the probability that it will land on a three? We know that a dice has the numbers one through six on it. So number of favorable outcomes would be landing on a three. Well, there's one three on a dice and there's six possible outcomes. So the probability of that happening would be one out of six. If you roll a dice once, what's the probability that it will not land on a two? Not landing on a two means everything except for two. There's one two on a dice and there's five other numbers. So the probability that it does not land on a two would be five, number of favorable outcomes. There are five numbers that are not two out of six possible outcomes. Now let's look at the spinner. Suppose we spin this spinner one time. What is the probability that it lands on a shaded section? First, we need to count how many total sections are on the spinner. And if we count that, there are seven sections on the spinner. So what is the probability that it lands on a shaded section? Shaded sections, there's one, two, three sections that are shaded either a dark gray or a light gray. So that's three out of seven so three sevenths chance that we land on a shaded region. Now, if we spin the spinner once, what is the probability that it lands on a white section? So what is the probability that it lands on a white section? Again, there are seven total sections. And if you count how many of those are white, there are four. So there's a four out of seven chance, four out of seven probability that it lands on a white section. Now let's jump into example one, finding the probability of mutually exclusive events. You rule a standard number cube, which is the same thing as a die. Let E represent the event roll an even number. So E represents rolling an even number and let T represent rolling a three or a five. 
we want to answer the question, what is the probability that you roll an even number or you roll a three or a five? Now, I know you could probably answer this question without making a Venn diagram, but I want you to just see how a Venn diagram might be helpful for us. So my E is rolling an even number. So I'm going to make a circle with E. Even numbers on a die are two, four, and six. Event T is a three or a five. Notice how, the, how there are no threes or fives in even numbers. So these circles do not need to overlap. Like we typically see overlapping circles in Venn diagrams. Mutually exclusive events will not have the circles overlapping. Three and five are separate. For my sample space S, there's still one more number that is not even or a three or a five, and that's the number one. So I'm going to put that outside my circles. So now with our Venn diagram, what is the probability that you roll an even number or a three or a five? Let's write that in probability notation. Probability of even number or three or five. So probability of E or T, we just need the number of favorable outcomes. So count up how many favorable outcomes there are. One, two, three, four, five, divided by the total possible outcomes. So that makes the probability five out of six. With probability, we can leave it as a fraction, but you also may be asked to express it as a percent or a decimal. To do that, just take your calculator and do five divided by six, and as a decimal, you'll get 0.83 repeating. If you want to switch from a decimal to a percent, you just move the decimal two spots to the right, and that's 83.3 repeating percent. So all three of those values are the probability of rolling an even number or a three or a five. Here we have the same scenario, but this time I'm not going to draw a Venn diagram. If you want to refer back to the Venn diagram that we just drew on the previous part, go ahead. This time we're going to roll the standard number cube once. What is the probability that you roll an even number and you roll a three or a five? This is different now. Notice the word and. And is different from or. Rolling an even number and a three or a five, I'm going to write probability of even number and three or five, so E and T. And for and to occur, that means it needs to be both even and a three or a five at the same time. But if you think about it, how many numbers on a dice are both even and three or five? Well, zero. There are zero outcomes out of the six possible outcomes. So the probability of that happening would be zero or zero percent. That's because those two events are mutually exclusive. It's impossible for them to happen at the same time. Finally, suppose you roll the standard number cube once again. What is the probability that you do not roll an even number? Do not roll an even number. Again, for my even numbers, that's two, four, and six. There are three even numbers. So probability that we roll something that's not even, how many numbers on the cube are not two, four, or six? Well, that leaves three numbers left out of the six. So our probability would be three, six. Make sure with fractions that you always reduce them. So three over six, we would reduce to one half. If we wanted to express that as a decimal, that's 0.5, or as a percent, 50%. So we just saw with mutually exclusive events, and remember that definition from the beginning, mutually exclusive events are events that cannot happen at the same time. To calculate the probability that event A or B happens, the way you can do that is you can add together the probability of event A happening plus the probability of event B happening. If they're mutually exclusive and you want them to both happen at the same time, that probability is going to be equal to zero. Remember that mutually exclusive events are events that look like this. If A and B are mutually exclusive, for one or the other happening, you're going to add the two probabilities together. 
for them both happening at the same time, that's impossible, so it's equal to zero. I want you to do the quick right here on your own and explain in your own words what is the difference between using the word or and using the word and in probability. Please pause the video. So or means that either event can happen. So one event can happen or the other event means either event can happen, whereas and means both events must happen at the same time. So your answer for your quick right probably looks a little bit different than mine, but it should be similar. So most of the time with probability, you're going to see those words and and or. But and and or also have another name in set notation, and those are called unions and intersections. A union is the probability that event A or event B occurs. So one event happens or the other. An intersection is the probability that event A and event B occur at the same time. And with unions, the symbol for the or is a U. So it looks like this, that's my union symbol. Whereas for an intersection, it's an upside down U like that. I always remember for set notation that this means and because if you were to kind of draw a line right there, it would be an A. So U means or and the upside down U that we see right here, the upside down U means and. In this class, we're mainly going to stick with the words or and and, but sometimes you'll see those notations throughout different textbooks. So here's our final example for 12.1 day one. And we have a box that contains 100 balls. 30 of the balls are purple. So we have 30 purple. 10 are orange. And let's just go ahead and figure out how many have to be a different color. So if we have 100 total balls and 30 plus 10 is 40, that means the remaining 60 must be some other color. So I like to just list those off here so that I can help see it kind of visually while I'm working with my calculations. Now, if you select one ball at random, what's the probability of the following events? Probability that it's purple or orange. I'm gonna write that as P short for purple, O short for orange. When we think about balls being purple or orange, those two events are mutually exclusive. You can't be purple and orange at the same time. So probability of purple or orange, if we use the formula that we just wrote, that's just the probability that it's purple plus the probability that it's orange. So purple, there are 30. So 30 out of 100 chance we get a purple ball. And there's 10 out of 100 chance that we get an orange ball. So now just add 30 and 10, and we're at 40. So there's a 40 out of 100 chance that you get a purple or an orange. As always, though, you want to make sure that you reduce your fraction. So I know that 40 and 100 are both divisible by 10, so I'm going to start there. And that's 4 over 10. Uh, but 4 and 10 are also both divisible by 2. So it finally reduces down to 2 fifths. Or as a decimal, that's 0.4 or as a percentage, that's 40%. So all of those ways would be ways to express the probability. For this next one, what's the probability that the ball is not purple and not orange? So it's not purple and it's not orange. Again, we had 100 balls. And if we go ahead and we subtract the 40 of those that were purple or orange, that leaves 60 other colors. We already calculated that up here as well. So the probability that the ball is not purple and not orange would be 60 out of 100. Again, we want to reduce that down. And that reduces down to, if we divide by 20, that reduces down to 3 out of 5. Or as a decimal, it's 0.6. Or as a percent, 60%. This try now is the exact same type of problem that we just looked at in example two, but this time, instead of drawing balls, you're going to draw socks. In Jackie's sock drawer, there are seven white socks, nine black, and five solid color socks. I want you to pause the video and calculate the probabilities of each of these three situations 
Please pause the video. When you hit play again, I'll have the answers and I'll explain them to you. Pause the video. So here are your answers. What is the probability that she picks a colored sock? Well, the first thing you need to do is figure out how many total socks are in the drawer. So I added seven plus nine plus five and got 21. Since five of the socks are colored out of 21 total socks, the probability that she picks a colored sock would be five out of 21. As a decimal, I rounded a little bit 0.238 or 23.8%. What is the probability that she picks a sock that's black or white? Here, instead of doing the probability separate, I first figure out how many socks are black or white. So I added the black socks, nine, and seven white. Nine plus seven was 16. So 16 out of 21 is the probability that the sock is either black or white. As a decimal, I rounded it to three decimal places, so 0.762 or 76.2%. And this last question here, what is the probability that she picks a sock that is white and black? It says in the directions there are seven white, nine black, and five solid colored socks. Solid color means there aren't any socks that are a mix. So zero socks are both black and white. So the probability of that happening would be zero or zero percent. So that is it for this lesson video. Thanks for watching and good luck as you try some problems on your own. Bye.